Ladies and gentlemen, I've always said that if I was proven wrong about 18 USC 795, I'd make a video about it. Is this that video though? Stick around, find out. For those of you who weren't there, I conducted my first live stream recently, and I had a ton of fun doing it. I'll try to do one again soon, but near the end of my live stream, I was told that my interpretation of 18 USC 795 was wrong by an individual identifying as Merb 34 ST. Merb 34 Street. We're gonna call him Merb. He informed me that he had made a video about me, me specifically, and why I was wrong, which I was tickled pink about. I created this video to explain to him why he's wrong. Merm starts his arguments by using the canons of construction, which are a set of rules that were established to help interpret documents. He brings up the ordinary meaning canon, stating words are to be understood by their ordinary everyday meaning, unless the context indicates they bear a technical sense. Already, we're on shaky ground, because the way the military defines a military installation, and the way popular dictionaries define military installations, and the way federal codes and statutes define installations, they're pretty dang close. But this gives Merb the opportunity to bring up the presumption of consistent usage canon, which means that words are presumed to maintain a consistent meaning throughout a legal document. And, since the commander isn't listed as the commander of the installation or equipment, and is instead listed as the commander of the post, camp, station, etc., then installation must not mean a post, camp, or station. It must be a technical term within the document. I mean, that's not the only thing that could mean, but if that's the direction he's going, I'll put myself at the disadvantage and play along. Next, he brings up surplusage canon, which states that, if possible, every word and every provision is to be given effect. This means that everything in 18 U.S.C. 795 should have a specific meaning. And here's where his argument against my information starts to get weird. He uses this multiple times to establish that this must mean 18 U.S.C. 795 only protects classified information. And he does this so that he can make a very specific argument, which will be introduced to later in the video. But that's just another assumption that he's making. There's nothing here that specifically indicates that the word choice establishes that 18 U.S.C. 795 only applies to information as opposed to, you know, locations. In fact, if we review Executive Order 10104, assuming that he is correct that installations and bases are two separate things within the statute, we can establish that it isn't limited in that way at all. The canons of construction only help to clarify that yes, installations and equipment are different from the post, camp, or station controlled by a commander, because they're located within the military, naval, or air force reservations, posts, arsenals, proving grounds, ranges, minefields, camps, bases, airfields, forts, yards, stations, districts, or areas, something that is conveniently ignored by MERB. Additionally, using those cans of construction that MERB was kind enough to bring into play, we can look further into Executive Order 10104, where it states that all official military, naval, or air force books, pamphlets, documents, reports, maps, charts, plans, designs, models, drawings, photographs, contracts, or specifications are protected from the general dissemination of information by 18 U.S.C. 795 as well. The surplusage canon, when applied here, would seem to indicate that data is considered a separate entity from locations. But before we get any further, I do want to discuss what an installation is defined as, starting with the definitions found in Army regulations. But surely, Army regulations are useless in this argument, right? They apply to the Army, whereas 18 U.S.C. 795 is a federal statute. That's something Merb was confused about as well. They're relevant because Executive Order 10104 gives the Secretaries of the Armed Forces the authority to designate, mark, or classify an installation that is restricted, confidential, secret, or top secret. This designation is done through regulations, create a blanket application of restricted designation. We'll be focusing on Army regulations specifically, instead of Navy, Air Force, or Marine regulations, because those are the ones I'm familiar with, since, you know, I was military police within the Army. Army Regulation 360-1 defines military installations as property owned or leased by federal or state governments for military purposes. This includes posts, camps, stations, training and testing areas, Army Reserve National Guard armories, and United States Army Reserve centers. Multiple individual locales in the same vicinity can compose one installation. So already, we find that the words installation, camp, station, post, and others are used more interchangeably than what Merb would want us to think. And that's not just within Army regulations. We also have definitions found in 32 CFR 50.3, 32 CFR 61.9, 32 CFR 105.3, 32 CFR 212.3, 10 USC 26A7, and 10 USC 2801. Um. But, Sergeant Blue Bacon, those only apply to specific sections of law. Yes. 
I know. But they establish a pretty interesting pattern of using those words pretty interchangeably. Even the Supreme Court seemed to say in APEL versus United States that to be considered a military installation, the location just needed to be DOD property run by a commander and mostly or completely closed to the public where training occurs, which is strangely close to the definition in AR 360 1, don't you think? It's no final nail in the coffin, but it definitely promotes the idea that Merb's initial argument is pretty. Meh. But let's do what Merb did ignore all that and keep reading AR 360 1. Ground or aerial photographs, sketches or graphic representations of classified military equipment, or installations designated as restricted areas, is punishable by law. And then, in parentheses, it, it puts 18 U.S.C. 795. Photographs of installations designated as restricted areas. Huh. Remember, this regulation comes from the Secretary of the Army, one of the people who has the authority to mark, designate, or classify an installation as restricted. So how does the Secretary of the Army define restricted areas? Well, AR 190-51 states that a restricted area is an area defined by an established boundary to prevent admission unless certain conditions or controls are met to safeguard the personnel, property, or material within. So essentially, for a base to be protected by 18 U.S.C. 795 and designated by the Secretary of the Army as a restricted installation, it just needs to be DOD property or buildings within DOD property controlled by a military commander within a fence line with an access control point. You know, just like any normal military base. Huh. Even without posted signs saying restricted area, this would still appear to apply. But Merbs isn't convinced when it comes to the signs. He thinks that the signs only state access to the installations restricted, not that the Secretary of the Army has determined the base is restricted per Executive Order 10104. But if that was the case, why wouldn't the signs just say, no trespassing, area off limits? You know, something that would be a lot clearer. It doesn't really make sense, right? Especially since we just established that restricting access to the installation meets the criteria for a restricted installation, as defined by the Secretary of the Army, which again means it meets the requirements for Executive Order 10104, which again means you can't by law film those buildings within that fence line. Which brings us to the ace in the hole that Merbs has been building towards this entire time. Executive Order 13526. Oh, I'm in trouble, folks. According to Merb, restricted is no longer used as a classification for data, since in 2009, former President Barack Obama issued that executive order, which does establish that the only classification for data information are confidential, secret, or top secret. Unless, of course, other classifications are established through statutes. This is why Merb was trying to use the canons of construction to argue that 18 U.S.C. 795 only apply to information, since those classification levels tend to only apply to information, and restricted is no longer a level of classified information. First, let's establish some facts. Restricted was actually removed as a classification of information in 1953 under Executive Order 10501 except when used to classify information regarding nuclear energy or weapons per the Atomic Energy Act of 1946. So this is nothing new. What was it you said in the video about me? I'm not terribly impressed with his uh, research skills. Huh. Weird. You know, it doesn't actually help my argument, but I wanted to make sure we're all getting the right information. Second, let me introduce my ace in the hole. Executive Order 10104 doesn't require a restricted classification. It states that the base can be classified or designated or marked as restricted. Whoops! Whoops! Oopsie! A sign, for example, such as this one, is enough to mark an area restricted. We've already established that even without a sign, the designation of a restricted area by the Secretary of Defense can be found in Army regulations. And I'm bringing those up again since some of you do get confused about this. Army regulations are incredibly relevant, despite Merb's claims to the contrary. Executive Order 10104, once again, grants the Secretary of the Army the ability to designate, mark, or classify a base as restricted. This is done through those regulations. I know, I keep repeating it, but it's because otherwise some of you are going to forget this. We also know that restricted must still be applicable in some way to military installations, because in 2018, a man trespassed onto a military base in Florida, a base with signs that said restricted area, and was convicted of filming in violation of 18 U.S.C. 795. Thank you, Zhao Qian Li, for being an idiot, because it establishes my next point. If the base wasn't restricted, he couldn't be convicted of filming a restricted base. 
It's as simple as that. Now, of course, this doesn't establish that 18 U.S.C. 795 applies to someone on public property. It only serves to show that installations can be restricted in accordance with the guidelines of 18 U.S.C. 795, as well as Executive Order 10104, and that 18 U.S.C. 795 is still an applicable law. But for evidence that it does apply to someone filming from public property, we can look to two cases, the Toledo Blade lawsuit and Genovese versus Town of Southampton. In Toledo Blade, two reporters were arrested for taking pictures outside of a military manufacturing plant in violation of 18 U.S.C. 795. They were detained, and their photos were deleted. They sued, claiming that their First, Fourth, and Fifth Amendment rights had been violated, and that the detaining officers had violated the Privacy Protection Act. Now, check out this statement released by the Deputy Public Affairs Officer for this facility. JSMC Lima is a restricted Department of Defense, government-owned, contractor-operated facility that fabricates and assembles armored combat vehicles and equipment for U.S. and foreign military customers. According to federal law and Army regulations, it is unlawful to take any photograph without first obtaining permission from the commanding officer. Signage to this effect is visible and warns that any such material found in the possession of unauthorized personnel will be confiscated. Apparently, the officer was right, because the constitutional claims were all dismissed by the judge, which definitely indicates that 18 U.S.C. 795 not only applies to someone filming from outside of a restricted area, but that the enforcement of the law doesn't violate a person's constitutional rights. It also strengthens my argument that Army regulations are relevant to 18 U.S.C. 795. Yes, the Toledo Blade reporters did win money from that lawsuit, but it was only for the claims that the Privacy Protection Act had been violated, which it would have been when the officers deleted their photos, if the reporters were on public property when detained. Photographs found in the possession of unauthorized personnel can be confiscated under 50 U.S.C. 797, but that only applies to people on DOD property, so we can establish that the filmers were likely in public, since the seizure and deletion was deemed improper. In Genovese versus Town of Southampton, it's a little more complicated. Genovese was outside of an Air National Guard training base. She was on public property and took pictures of the installation, despite signs prohibiting it. An off-duty officer saw this, detained her, and called for security to take over. He was on vacation. He didn't want to stick around for any longer than he had to. But he knew the federal law and decided to act. The security officers called the local police. And when the cavalry arrived, they took over and then charged her with trespassing. There was no reason to believe that she had trespassed. They then held her in jail for a few days before releasing her with a, hey, have a nice day and forget about it, huh? New York, you know. She sued the town and they didn't respond. So she filed a $70 million default judgment, which she would have won, and the town continued to be silent. But unfortunately for her, she got a response and an apology. It turns out that the person who was originally supposed to respond was dealing with the death of two family members within the week and had failed to finalize the response to the original filing. Genovese and her lawyers argued that a person could not be detained for filming from public, and the judge told them no. They were wrong, according to 18 U.S.C. 795. Not only could she be detained, she could also have been arrested for that crime. He then challenged Genovese's lawyers to find a reason why 18 U.S.C. 795 wouldn't apply to a person in public. And they couldn't. They submitted a letter to the judge saying that they couldn't find a legitimate reason. Genevieve was awarded $1.112 million for being falsely arrested for trespassing, but the judge had to limit it to a payout of $700,000. Now, of course, I'm paraphrasing this case, and as always, I encourage you to read the case yourself, but Merb, when you told me that the lawyers I discussed 18 U.S.C. 795 with were wrong because I wasn't paying them to look into it, and possibly because it disputed your thoughts on this matter, it turns out that paying a lawyer to look into it yields pretty similar results to what I was told for free. Merb actually made a second video preparing for my counterargument, where he was quick to point out that this was just a district court decision, and the burden of proof isn't as strong in a civil case, which this was, when compared to a criminal case. And he is correct. But here's why I use it. It discusses federal law, which should apply uniformly between districts and states, and there isn't a case that disputes it. Not that Merb or myself is aware of anyway. While it may not establish case law, it certainly doesn't hurt. It has been brought up to me that Genevieve's claims were dismissed without prejudice, which means they could have been refiled in a higher appellate court, which isn't out of the ordinary. The thing is, they weren't refiled within the required six months, so that argument doesn't really add anything to the discussion. Now, there are a few other things to bring up. Merb thinks that outside of a fence line of a military base, but still within DOD property, the First Amendment can't be restricted by police. Well, 
if we return to APAL versus the United States, it turns out that the Supreme Court has ruled that federal statutes can be enforced by DOD-affiliated police on DOD property, even on a public easement outside of a restricted area, and even when those laws restrict First Amendment activities. So, sorry, Murr, but that case is not only more relevant than United States versus Grace, which you tried to use to dispute this, but also more recent. Hmm. The other thing that I want to bring up is that Merb essentially states that because he has never seen a case in which a person has been convicted of 18 U.S.C. 795 while filming from public, it must not apply to someone filming from public. This is called desuetude. When a case hasn't been enforced in a long enough period of time, that it is considered unenforceable. The issue with this argument is that this law has been enforced recently, so it isn't much of an argument there. What he has failed to mention is that there aren't any successful challenges to this law either. He also brings up the constitutionality of enforcing 18 U.S.C. 795 on someone in a traditional public forum. And for that, we turn to time, place, and manner restrictions of the First Amendment, specifically what Ward v. Rock Against Racism established in 1989. In that case, the Supreme Court of the United States stated that there were three things that needed to be met for a law to restrict the freedom of expression in a public forum. One, it must be narrowly tailored to serve a significant government interest. Two, it must leave open ample alternative channels for communication. Three, it must be content neutral. If this law is going to be determined to be unconstitutional, this is how it will likely be done, by establishing that it doesn't meet one or more of these elements. So far, nobody has been able to do that. Someday, that may change. But that's something that will definitely have to be argued in court. Personally, my views on what is necessary to ensure the safety of an installation will probably differ from those of you who have never served in the military. My first installation that I was stationed at after graduating from my initial military police training was overseas, where there was no prohibition on the filming of an American military installation. We were often made aware by military intelligence that our installation was under constant surveillance by individuals who could be directly linked to the terrorist organization ISIS. But there was nothing we could do, except hope that they didn't gather enough information to figure out the best time to drive a vehicle borne improvised explosive device through our main gate. You know, the sort of information that you can't find through Google Maps or Street View. Oh, by the way, Merb, the Posse Comitatus Act, not the, uh, what did you call it? The Posse Comitatus Act, sucker. Ah, that's the one. It only establishes that with some exceptions, soldiers can't be used to enforce law on civilians outside of DOD property. It doesn't establish that army regulations can't be used to designate restricted areas in conjunction with federal law. In conclusion, Merb's interpretation doesn't match the interpretation of this statute by the Secretary of the Army, or Joseph Bianco, the United States District Judge, ruling over Genovese's case, or the lawyers being paid to find a reason why that law wouldn't apply to Genovese on public property, or any military or civilian attorney that I've ever discussed this with. Does this law get enforced often? No. Can it be enforced? Yes. Could it, at some point in the future, be deemed unconstitutional by a higher court? Yes. Has it been since it began as a Congressional Act in 1938? No. Sorry, Merb. You did put forth a hell of an argument, though, and I appreciate it. Best of luck out there, and until the next time, be good, stay safe.